welcome to the Overland Drill Podcast. I am your host, Scott Brady, and for this week, my co-host, Matt Scott, and I talk about our recent vehicle mashup. So this is all of the vehicles that we've been testing and using in the field over the last six months. That includes some really interesting time in the Ford Raptor R and in the TRX. We also spent quite a bit of time in the Hummer EV SUV, as well as the Rivian R1S SUV. And then we had some really amazing surprises with the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk 4xE, which we'll talk about in great detail. And then we also were able to drive the GMC AT4X Sierra, which is their 1500 or their half-ton variant that even has rear and front lockers along with Multimatic suspension and a bunch of other things. We talk about some other cars as well, uh, but this is really our overview of some of the newest Overland vehicles on the market. So please enjoy our conversation about trucks. This content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. So, Matt, we have had a lot of cars. All of we, them. Well, I think that this is the first time ever that we've actually had more test vehicles come through this parking lot than the vehicles that you have personally purchased. Yeah, I'm, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> um, I mean, it has been, I mean, if we were to do like the whiteboard list, there are many times that Matt is buying cars personally faster than we're getting in test vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but you got it. It's a, it's it's a, a fun problem. hobby for you, and you 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 have it. somehow made managed to make it work, and many times make money. Yeah, which yeah, is or 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 lose a only a small amount, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, yeah, which is pretty amazing. I mean, we've got a list of vehicles that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about the Raptor R. We're going to talk about the TRX. We're going to talk about the Grand Cherokee Trailhawk 4xE. We're going to talk about the Wrangler 4xE, the Rivian R1S, the Hummer SUV, the Defender 130, the Maverick Tremor, the AT4X, and also a big update on the Grenadier because I spent mm. some more time in yeah. that incredible yeah. vehicle. So um, we were going to talk about some Grand Touring stuff, but you're going to have to wait till another yeah, podcast. We're just, to, we're just not going to make it work. Too, too much on the, too too many, much on the docket. Too much on the docket. Uh, but we are going to start covering a little bit more Grand Touring because it is such a fun way to travel, and Matt and I enjoy it. So that's what this has always been about, is doing the things that, yeah. that bring us joy. So um, Grand Touring happens to now be one of those things. So yeah, yeah. We promise to not have too many sailboat or – Grand Touring Podcast. But people but seem to like it. They do. The, and the I num- like talking about it. The numbers have been good. Well, I think it'd be fun to start off with these super trucks. Yeah, so the yeah, Raptor yeah. R and the TRX. It very much seems like the Raptor R was Ford's somewhat expedient response to the TRX. What do you think? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I had a TRX when they first came out. It was you had a, a, you had a Raptor, too. I had a Raptor. Um Jeez. Yeah, it see it I think people thought that the Raptor R was going to be a like TRX killer. And I don't think it turned out to be a TRX killer. Well, and I and I've driven them now back to back and yeah. it's like so this is something worth talking about. We have always avoided testing these long travel yeah. desert oriented trucks. 
many people actually use Raptors for overlanding, mm. and there are certain configurations where they actually make a lot of sense. Um, in fact, when I rolled into Ushuaia on Expedition 7, the only other overlander at the place we were staying was a Raptor with a four-wheel camper in the back of it. So um, they have been driven clearly. Yeah, I mean, they're long, an F-150 long with distances. better factory suspension. They're a little wider. <clears throat> the downside is they have always been neutered on payload. So you end up with a payload less than a Honda Accord yeah. in a full-size truck. And that means that you really can't put a camper in it. You really, I mean, if you have three full-size adults, you can't even put, a 500 pound tongue weight mm. of towing something behind yeah. it. So, but that is starting to improve. So the Raptor R 700 horsepower, 5.2 liter supercharged V eight, um, like 15 inches of suspension travel, 37 inch tires from the factory. It's big. And it has a 1600 pound payload. So you can actually yeah. start to carry some stuff, put that, a light rack the on the back. Same as my prospector was. Yeah. So there you go. So, and that's after all the cool stuff. So it's got yeah. already got all the cool stuff yep. on it and it's got a 1600 pound payload. So this was my, the, I've driven your TRX before, yeah. um, very short distances, but actually on a fairly technical piece of trail. And that shocked me how mm. well, how much articulation it had and how it performed. It works with what it has pretty, yeah. pretty good. Rear locker and everything else. But the, <clears throat> the, the Raptor R was really the first time I've had a long test period with one of these super trucks and a lot of positive impressions on the Raptor. It, it feels like, um, cheap the, plastic. Sorry. <laughs> well, and that's what we'll talk about. Cause that's the real difference with yeah. the TRX, but the Raptor feels like a very well executed performance package. Mm. So when it comes to driving at high speed on the dirt, um, when it comes to how the transmission works, how it actually drives in a performance setting, I was extremely impressed. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, it, it has it has an incredible amount of reserve capacity and performance. Um, the challenge is finding a place to actually test that safely. So the only time I was able to do that was in a wash where it's not a public road. You're able to Extra, to drive. You have yeah, plenty of get after it. Yeah, you have plenty of of, of visibility, um, but everything else you kind of have to be careful. And that's the downside to these trucks is that they can be driven at speeds that are not legal on forest roads or BLM roads, which most of those have a twenty five. They, they can be driven at speeds that just aren't safe, even in closed courses. I yeah. mean, you're you're talking about vehicles now that are approaching, you know. Like, like they're not race cars is what I'm trying to get at, but they're approaching the same speeds and, you know, they have pretty decent wheel travel now. Yeah. Um, and you can really get yourself into some trouble. And 37s too. So yeah. the tire size has gotten so big. They, they are, it's, it's incredible. The Raptor just kept getting better and better and better as the speed went up. Yeah. Um, and it, it has, I mean, this is another thing. It has 700 horsepower. If you think you're going to hop in that thing and like stick it in two wheel drive and lock the rear diff and like kind of have some fun with this thing, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> like this is literally what I do for a living. And I, I did that for a bit yeah. and it was extremely you can, fun. You can put it in two wheel drive still. You can. Yeah. And in TRX, it's all wheel drive or nothing. That's right. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can have the Raptor in two wheel drive. 700 horsepower going to 37 in the rear. Mm -hmm. And if you think about accelerating the car sideways, I mean, you haven't even touched the accelerator yet. Yeah, your your brain has thought, I'm going to accelerate in this corner to get a little bit of rotation. And the car is already sideways. It's moving. Um, and yeah, they are, in, they are incredible. But what I found myself doing is just going into Baja mode, all wheel drive. And then the thing was mm -hmm. much safer, much more enjoyable. Like over the top, absolutely over the top. But because it has a 1600 pound payload, you can put a lightener rack in the back. You put a roof tent on the thing that yeah. hopefully would hold together. I don't know what roof tent would be the right choice, but something that would hold together. Yeah, yeah. Maybe some deck drawers and you're, you've you got have a great travel that's pretty vehicle. practical that yeah. has a warranty that has, um, a, a, it, it'll have a great resale value. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably people that bought, I mean, 
I think I think when the Raptors launched, if I if I recall correctly, they started at just under forty thousand dollars. Like those trucks now have one hundred and fifty thousand miles on them, and they're still thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, like that. I mean, we're 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 talking about a car that has a really really great residual value. It's an F one fifty. It has all the practicalities of an F one fifty. My problem with them is there's the sticker price of a Raptor R. Um, you're not going to get one at sticker price. Maybe in a couple years you'll be able to get one. They sell for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, it was incredible though, yeah. and it's just it's so inspiring to see the kinds of performance on the full spectrum. So let's look at a a Rubicon, a twentieth anniversary Rubicon. Yeah. And then let's look at a Raptor R. So the, as slow as you can go with the Rubicon, and it's like nothing that's ever been made before. Yeah. And then you have as fast as you can go, like a TRX or is a Raptor, yeah. and there's nothing like that that's ever been made before. 700 horsepower supercharged engines with over a foot of travel. Yeah. 37. Uh, they're just unbelievable on yeah. both sides of the spectrum. It's so and, exciting. And, and it's, it'll be crazy to see where these things go because obviously they have these very profitable, uh, you know, uh, uh, models. Now Raptor is big business, not only for Ford, but for dealers, because rather than selling an F-150, I mean, historically it was, you know, five, 10, 15,000 under sticker, you're starting to create something that's desirable enough that people are paying, not not only a, a, buying a more premium F-150, but then they're paying over sticker. Yeah, everybody's making more money on it. Yeah, and 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 same with. I can't even imagine what some of these people's car payments are, because it yeah, used to be that nine to ten percent. It used to be that premium vehicles like that they were really for the affluent, and they would people would come in and write a check for it. But yeah. but people do. There, there's a lot of people that are rich there's not a lot of people anymore that are wealthy and the distinction that i put is someone that's rich makes a lot of money but they have no cash mm -hmm. um and it used to be that wealthy people would go and buy a rolls royce or whatever and they would pay cash for it because they had so much money yeah and now you have these rich people people that are have good income mm -hmm. um and they can afford a two thousand dollar a month there, payment. There's so many Raptors, and there's so many TRXs in the town that we live in. Yeah, it's, um, they're everywhere. Like, it, yeah, it, you're you're not going to be it, in in most towns in the West, and I'm sure the East. You're not going to be if, if your goal is to be the unique guy on the block. You're probably not going to do it with a Raptor or a TRX anymore. But there's a reason for that. We know that these trucks are fantastic on the road. Like I, I I'm shocked. I, I think shocked. My Raptor was a 2018. They have upgraded them from them. They went from having uh, leaf springs in the rear to coil springs and a five link in the rear. Kind of this trailing arm design that's really cool. That I don't did they, did they get a little bit more power? But it's it's a similar drivetrain. A little bit more wheel travel, a little bit more refinement in the cab. Um, and then you have the TRX, which is just this. Like yeah, so let's shift to the TRX. And then maybe I'll give a little bit of my insights around comparison. But I drove your TRX, but I was, I was very much, I had a job to do with it that day with a rack that we had on there that we were getting some photography for. And, and I, it was amazing. Uh, but I didn't. I didn't drive it for that reason. Mm. And plus, I'm driving my buddy's truck, so I'm not going to be testing. Jump it! I'm not going to be <laughs> testing your car. So, but the thing that I noticed, I just came out of the Raptor. Yeah, and, you had that last week. Yep, yeah, and I'm now in the TRX. The TRX is across the board. It feels more premium. Mm. It feels more super truck. It feels more powerful. It is much more comfortable on the road. Yeah. It's quieter than the Raptor. Um, the, the TRX, in my mind, feels like this premium, expensive super truck. Yeah. Whereas the Raptor felt like a very well-engineered, off-road, high-performance truck. Yes. I think that the Raptor is a better... Yeah, I'll say it. I, I think that the Raptor is a better off-road truck. Um, I think that they're a little bit less precious. I think they're, um, 
more wheel travel, more of an aftermarket, more aftermarket availability. Like the, the problem with the TRX, if you like to, you know, fiddle with things is you're kind of looking at what you're going to get out of that platform. Um, you're not going to get much more wheel travel. You're not really going to fit much more of a tire on there. Ford has has this thirty seven package, which is like that's what ours was. Super, was yeah. I think the Raptor R's all come standard with them. Super, super, super cool. Um, I'm. It's almost a. Uh, I'll call it a three way race. There's the Raptor R and there's the TRX. The best choice out of all of them is probably the standard Raptor. I don't think that you necessarily need the power of these vehicles. When you're in low range, you're not using it. Not even you're, close. I mean, you're on idle. And you, I mean, if you. You if, cannot use 700 horsepower. If you want to see what the back of your truck looks like while you're still sitting in the front seat, <laughs> use all 700 horsepower <laughs> on these trucks. The TRX, it does not have the wheel travel to take advantage of 700 horsepower. And it's softer sprung. So that means everything up until a big event, yeah. the TRX felt better. Mm-hmm. Very comfortable off-road. Like cycling through washes and yeah. over bumps. It's and, a lot more active suspension, yeah. I've found. Whereas the big hits, the Raptor was like, it shocked me how good it was. Yeah, more suspension travel is going to yep. do that. And the aftermarket, the, the, the chassis mm-hmm. on the Raptor has more capability in it. You know, yeah, like there, sense. there are things that you can then go and do to a Raptor to make it, you know, I mean, a stock Raptor off road, there, there are, there are race cars that have less horsepower and less wheel travel that have roll cages. Yeah, sure. And, um, that's, that's always been an interesting thing for me with these super trucks Yeah, is now guys can have a, I think how how people build trucks has changed with the availability of all of these aftermarket or sorry, I'm going to start over there with the availability of all of these factory packages. It just makes more sense to have the car payment. We live in a society now and the that is run on credit. And the warranty and like, all the engineering that goes behind like it. Like you could, you yes. Like I remember when the Raptor came out, oh, well, I could build that. I'm like, okay, cool. Wait, and now and and now it's just easier to to finance or write the check at the dealer or whatever your final position is. Like I don't I don't really care about that. But a lot of people just go and like you said, they 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 want to have the payment, they get the truck, and it actually makes a lot of sense. That's frankly, I mean, that's what I do now is yeah. you can go out and just get one of these things. You do a few little modifications. Like that's why, you know, I mean, I want to know how many like Raptor Baja design fog pocket kits they've sold kind of thing. Cause that's really all that people are doing to them. You'll get some guys that do more, but I think that's like the Raptor crowd. I think the TRX is this grand touring pickup truck. That's really capable off road, <laughs> but is so, so comfortable. It, sh- it was shocking. Like, I, I mean, for, for those that are interested in the difference between the two, when I was driving the TRX, I felt like I was in one of the finest luxury sedans hmm. that I've, I mean, I drive a lot of those too. And it was I, absolutely yeah. quiet, plush, powerful. Um, I just did a, an hour and a half each way drive yesterday and it was seamless. Yeah. I mean, effortless, my, quiet, my, powerful. My current daily is a E63 S AMG wagon. It's really comfortable. I mean, if you're talking about an Autobahn cruiser or whatever that may be, that is the definitive car in yeah. that segment. The TRX is quieter inside. It is more comfortable inside because you just have more space. You know, it is a pickup truck at the end of the day. So putting your feet up on the dash or this or that or whatever, it's just very comfortable. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it has all the power you need. I mean, oh you, my you, gosh! It, it, yes, the wagon's faster. By how much though? Like a, a TRX is four seconds. Four seconds, and then this is under. Th- this one's under three, but none of that matters. I mean, it's, it's like all, a blink of an it, eye. It, it doesn't. It they doesn't matter. They both feel incredibly powerful. The 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 TRX feels like a Mercedes. Yeah. The um, the Raptor feels like a Volkswagen, or well, it, it just like feels like a Ford. Feels like an F one fifty. You get. 
I mean, there's things that drive me crazy on Fords, and you still you still get that with the Raptor. It's the the little. I mean, I I, I complain about it all the time, but like the the mold seam lines everywhere on an F one fifty, the the like textured, you know, plastic with the leather grain in it. Yeah. You know, it's it's very. The buttons feel cheap. Everything kind of feels like there's engineering behind it. And then like an accountant came in and just, you know, Ford, great engineers, even better accountants. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just how I feel with the Raptor, but. And it doesn't feel, even though the numbers are very similar, it does not feel as powerful as the TRX. Um, and it's not as comfortable as the TRX, but it does, it is a better performing vehicle at the limits in my experience. Yeah. And now that I've driven both, I guess this is kind of my summary, um, more of as a validation of are these great overland vehicles? I think for some people they are, mm. um, but for me, no. I would not consider either one of these things for a personal vehicle because I don't need something with 700 horsepower. I want something with fuel economy and range. I want something preferably diesel. Yeah. And it just, and for, so for me personally, even though they, ha they are incredible tools, um, they are incredible performance machines, the TRX I liked a little bit better, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a truck for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I sold my TRX to get a Prospector. Mm. Um, Prospectors, you know, in that same financial realm as some of those trucks, Prospectors a better choice. Um, if I was heading down to Baja or wanted to have a, a truck that, well, I mean, I've used these trucks. I've taken Raptors everywhere. I've taken TRXs everywhere. They're really fun. For me, is it an Overland truck? Yeah, for sure, because you can just throw a tent in the back and yeah. you have this factory engineered long travel, whatever. You keep it within its realm and it's and it's pretty good. I, for an off-road vehicle, I would still rather have the Raptor. Um, for a luxury vehicle, I would rather have the TRX. Yeah, yeah, it's a great way to just to sum it up. Yeah, But they're very cool, and for those that have them... In fact, if anybody is listening and they use one of those vehicles... For their travels we, i'd love to hear more about yeah. that i'd love to see some photos i'd love to see how you're using it um people use them and abuse them and they do they they put up with it all right so now we're going to move into the plug-in hybrid and ev territory we're going to talk about grand cherokee trailhawk 4xe wrangler 4xe rivian r1s and hummer suv i think i think i'm going to start with this trailhawk 4xe mm. because Probably for the first time in many years did I have a vehicle that completely took me by surprise. Yeah. Where I came in with a like a like a fixed impression or a bias. Let's even call it like I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, and Grand I, Cherokees have always been there, but they're kind of like yeah, they're good cars. Like my, it seems like my family owns eighty-seven of them. Yeah, they're and, just a practical choice. Yep, yeah, they they are amazing vehicles. Um, I just they've just completely gone off my radar as an off-road or an overland they've always vehicle. the grand cherokee has always been that like weird like yeah some wrangler parts and some cherokee parts will bolt onto it but like but the grand cherokee platform has just continued to get better and better and yeah. better and better and it's particularly the, the you know the trailhawk 4 by e is like most people listening to this podcast probably should drive one i i, I would buy yeah. one yeah. It, it is absolutely a vehicle that I would buy. I mean, let's, let's just run down real quick through the specs. This thing does 435 horsepower, 0 to 60 in 5.5 seconds. It gets a combined, they call it like a MPGE MPG -E between the engine and the electric in the 40 mile per gallon range. Yeah. It has 30 miles of electric only, which means you do all of your little local, like where we live in Prescott, yeah. I could use electric only at one quarter of the price of filling up the fuel tank. It has 31 inch diameter tires, all terrains. That used to be big. That doesn't sound like much now, but that used to be it's plenty, really big. It's plenty big. Yeah. It's plenty big. It has skid plates throughout, airbag suspension with two off-road height modes, which to be clear, off-road two is used to clear over something. You do not drive in off-road yeah. two. It is so brutal. There's no drown, down travel left. But if you need to get over a ledge, put it in off-road two, yeah. go over the obstacle, and then put it back down into off-road one. Center locking differential, rear locking differential, 
low range, <clears throat> and this new one has a front sway bar disconnect. That's that was the crazy thing that surprised me with it. it to- yeah. I didn't know it until I got into the car, and I'm like, "What is this magic?" Yeah. So, like uh, on a Jeep Rubicon, where you can push the button and you gain all of this articulation and you reduce head toss. Yeah. So this Grand Cherokee in in off road one mode, I mean, it flexes way more than I've seen any independent vehicle flex. Mm. And the head toss is way down. You don't get that really busy ride. You're not getting kind of tossed around the cabin. It still tows 6,000 pounds. So you're going to tow any kind of off-road trailer. It's like the overland. It's like the the, the best over daily driver an overlander could ever hope for. It's like the one car to rule them all. or whatever. It's like the one car. If you need to drive back and forth to work and your commute's 10 miles, you're never going to use any fuel. Yeah. You I'm just go going to plug into your electricity. I don't have to pay for electricity. <laughs> know, you do. You get to plug in anywhere you want. <laughs> Matt, my electricity is your electricity. Oh, thanks, thanks, buddy. So I think that this is an amazing car. I, I am, I'm literally blown away yeah. by how good it is. And it looks good. The interior quality, which is something like... It's a I, little a bit bigger car, too. Interiors. And it's good. If I'm, you know, cars are expensive these days, and I think... Okay, and that's the coup de gra- that's the coup de gras. So the coup de gras of these of these Trailhawk four by E's, and I did not again. I didn't know this because the way that we got the car was a little bit out of order. And I didn't. It just showed up, so mm-hmm. I wasn't. I didn't do a lot of research. Brian McVickers drove it back from Moab, and like here, all of a sudden, we have this car. So I, yeah. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know anything about it. I thought we just had another Grand Cherokee. This vehicle with all of those features. It costs sixty eight thousand dollars, mm. which it still seems like a lot of money. But if you look at any car today, like we were just talking about about Ford Mavericks that are being sold over sticker for sixty eight thousand dollars. Forty eight, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, crazy, crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, so, it's so a hell you, of a deal. You 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 actually figure that when the world gets back to normal, the automotive world, the dealership world. Um, you know, that means that $68,000 MSRP, that means you're paying low 60s, high 50s for that in the real world. Because the, the Grand Cherokee doesn't have that, like most of these capable off-road vehicles, you're paying still ten to $15,000 yeah. over a sticker for yeah. them. That's where it becomes reasonable. It does. And, and I'm not saying it's better than any of the other great SUVs out there. I'm not saying it's better than a... It's on par with a 200. It's on par with a 4Runner. If you're considering some other vehicle like that, just go check this. Yeah, this I, think it's, I think it's worth looking. Just go check, check it out. And the 4xE drivetrain. Like, I'm I've a known, fan. I've known quite a few people that have had these now. I've never heard them complain about reliability or having any yeah. issues. Um, yeah. Yeah, so check out the Grand Cherokee Trailhawk 4xE. It is... It's, it's one of the vehicles that has surprised me more than yeah. anything that I've driven in many years. And also check out the, the, the Wrangler four by E there's a lot of resistance to EVs within the overland space for, for good reason. And for, I think misunderstandings, but one of the best selling plug-in hybrids in America is the Wrangler. Yeah, it's the best selling electrified vehicle in America in 2022, yeah. I think. Cause it, it's kind of how people use Wranglers. They don't, tend to do long commutes in them. Yeah. So it has about a 25 mile electric range. Um, they, they're quick. It has yeah. 435 horsepower and then you can get it in a Rubicon. So you can have an electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, a gasoline only vehicle, something with front and rear lockers and a sway bar disconnect on 35s. The roof you, comes <laughs> off. The doors come off. It's like you can, you can see why yeah. they sell 8 billion of these things. They, they work. I see them all over, all yeah. over Prescott. Again, um, Such a win. The EV thing. If you live in a city, EV is probably ready for you now. Yeah. Where we live, kind of rural northern Arizona, you know, EVs are fine for around town, but I don't know. It's a little bit of a it's, challenge. It's a little it's bit infra- of a challenge. It's an infrastructure right issue. Although Prescott just got its first supercharger. Oh. Yavapai College. Yavapai College. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So we, we're up from one charger with two cables <laughs> at the Hilton Garden Inn. We should talk about the Rivian R1S because 
Um, there's actually, I don't, there's not a lot that I kind of want to riff on with this car other than it's not only the best electric SUV I've ever tested. It's one of the best SUVs yeah. I've ever tested. And, and this is for me personally, one of my most favorite cars that I've ever owned was a 2007 Range Rover Mark III. Yeah. And I loved everything about that car. While I owned it, it was very reliable. It was one of the most beautiful capable, the broadest spectrum mm. of attributes that I have ever had in a vehicle that I owned. The R1S most closely matches so like that experience. Like the right experience. size? Yes. Like it's that Tundra, first gen Tundra size in the pickup truck and, and, yep. and Mark III Range Rover and the yep. SUV. Yep. I mean... Y- it's you're- incredibly fast. 3.2 seconds, zero to 60, 800 and something horsepower, 300 and something mile range. Airbag suspension, 34-inch all-terrains from the factory. It's huge. And the ground clearance, like when, when we had that one, I, I, I sat underneath it. 15 inches I'm like, of ground clearance. I'm like nearly sitting. It's not like I'm like trying to get underneath it. I'm like, oh, I'm underneath it. Like, oh, I can kind of sit up here. <laughs> like yeah. you drive behind a Rivian and it just, the architecture of the suspension looks purpose built. It's really good. Um, it's really good off-road. Um the the EV all EVs have the same issue, which is this kind of low speed climbing over big rocks and ledges. We've talked about that in the past, but and the Rivian's not exempt from that. Um, but it is an incredibly fine automobile. It's beautifully designed. It's so minimalist, which is just like makes me in such a happy place. So we we disagree so, a little bit on that. Like, I know I really like it, but I I, I love the. Minimalist I want some damn interior. buttons. Uh, yeah, I love that. It's just so. Yeah. Minimalist and like reduc reducted, re, you know, reductionist. Yeah. So some of it, some of the interior feels a little cheap to me because I'm thinking startup didn't need to design <laughs> the buttons, put it in the screen. It's a simple solution. I get it. <laughs> but Rivians also are not, they're an expensive vehicle, right? Um, but, but they're, they're not, not as crazy. expensive as you'd they're actually not crazy. think. Like they're not crazy. Expensive. Um, you know, I sold, I sold my AEV prospector XL and I'm, one feeling dumb about it because I've now realized how expensive trucks have become. Yeah. Um, you know, that, 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 even though it was only one year, the cost of a pickup truck has gone up about 20%. Yeah. Um, from my actual, somebody who buys a lot of vehicles, it feels 20% more expensive, but the Rivians just aren't, you know, you can get a Rivian R1T or R1S effectively new. So if you go to the website and you buy one, um, I think there's somewhere between six to 12 months on a, on a delay. And before. then double that. <laughs> yeah, probably. But there's so many people that have basically just bought allocations to flip them that an R1T you're looking in the 80 to 90 range and the R1S being a little bit more, a little newer and fewer of them on the market, you're looking right around 100. Um, you, you can't get an F250 for that. You can't get a Raptor for that. Um, you know, you, you can, this is faster than a Raptor. Yeah. You can barely get a standard, like, I mean, you're, you're, you're basically competing with regular pickup trucks. Yeah. It regular pickup trucks might be more expensive at this point. If you're comparing speed and power and torque and yeah. all of that kind of stuff, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's, it's very interesting right now. Yeah. And the Rivians are, are amazing. And the, one of the things that I love about the company is that it is it is a startup filled with incredibly passionate people yeah. that truly believe in their product. Yeah, they really do. I mean, they've worked with Bill Burke. They really care about the off road performance. And then they're going to have they're going to come out with this dual motor model, and they're going to come out with some things that I think will be even make them even more appealing. But if you're looking at a electric SUV. And you're I not looking at the Rivian. Yeah, it's kind of amazing. I so. think I do think you know we, we keep getting little little teaser tidbits of the all electric G wagon, which really yeah. really excites me. But, um, gee, what's the markup going to be on those? Yeah, incredible. I mean, G sixty threes. You have to have your own like nuclear power plant next to the house. Yeah, <laughs> unless it's unless it's some kind of you know it's Mercedes. Their first car was electric. Yeah. Like, I mean, the first car Mercedes made electric. Um, they're now getting back into electric. We had the EQE EQS and yeah. EQS. And this isn't really a, 
this isn't an overlander. This isn't really a grand tourer, but it's important to get these new vehicles in to just compare to what they are to others. Yeah. You know, learn the new technology is like, important to us. The reason I bring it up is I, I think the Rivian's really cool. I do not like how it drives. Um, it, it drives like a golf cart to me. It, once you get past the, um, the, you know, the kind of what feels like a one trick pony of the instant power and the launch and, and that kind of stuff, the one pedal thing drives mm. me crazy. Yeah. It would be nice. Cause if it's, it, if it you would, get any kind of yeah. motion sickness as a person, which however this works out, I do, you're always kind of like any, any, any change in throttle Yeah, and you're, you kind of get this like, you know, uh, uh, feels like a car at 60 mile an hour in third gear. It would be nice if they had a way to reduce that. Yeah, and they, I don't think that it's that exciting to, well, it's exciting to drive because it's fast. I don't think that it's a good experience, but with the Mercedes, I loved how that car drove. It drives like a car that happens to be electric. Yeah, It is you, not- You would never know that it was. You would, you yeah. would never know. Yeah. It, it has the option of the one pedal thing, but if you're not crazy on that, which, which I mean, I get why they're kind of doing it, but it just, I like it. I just know how to drive uh, like with one pedal, you know, it's all this weird, this weird thing and I don't like it, but maybe I'll get used to it. But I do like it. Yeah. I do yeah. Like so it. there you go. I, I, I think the EQS I prefer it actually, it just felt like a more of a traditional car. Totally. Um, but it was well, the only thing I didn't, and we'll talk about the EQS in another episode it was a little bit ugly. more. It was not so ugly from the front. It was handsome, but from any other angle, it was not. Yeah. And then, like, what is the one thing about an electric vehicle that makes it totally unique? The frunk. Yeah. And that car did not have I a frunk. Not, I didn't open the... It was so sad. Like, it's like... Design-wise, like, it was just... Yeah, it was bulbous. It was very eggy. It was a, it was a Mazda CX-9. Uh, I mean, again, from the front, I thought it was handsome. Yeah. Yeah. Right? But any other angle, it was pretty egg shaped. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Which is also what made it incredibly quiet and aerodynamic. And aerodynamic. I mean, and so serene to drive. Serene to drive. Absolutely. I had those little pillows for your head. I know. It was crazy. It's nice. It's crazy. I liked it. But so, important so yeah. to drive that stuff just to see yeah. how it positions um, and learn these new technologies because it's important to us because we know it's changing. Things are changing. Yeah. People are going to be buying them. Um, so the other electric SUV that we drove was the Hummer SUV, which the Hummer SUV is, it's, it's like driving any other, like a TRX or any other kind of, of, of vehicle in the sense that it has a regular shifter. You can turn off the one pedal drive. Mm. It drives very, very n normal. I mean, it drives mm. like a normal vehicle and because it has the rear steer, it drives more compact than it actually yeah. is. Um, it's incredibly fast, uh, 3.5 seconds, zero to 60 for that one under the launch conditions. Um, and, and it looks a lot better than the truck. The biggest mm -hmm. complaint I had with the Hummer truck is I just don't care for that kind of vestigial bed with yeah. the weird angle to it. I, I just don't think it made the truck very handsome. Uh, whereas the SUV in my mind is a lot more attractive looking vehicle. It, I'm so impressed with so much that GM is doing right now. And then this Hummer thing comes out and it's like, oh God, it's bad. But you know what's Let gonna, it die. You know what's going to happen though is that we're going to end up with a Yukon yeah. AT, AT4 electric. And, and it's going to look be And it'll look great. great. It'll be great. And it'll be great. So it... It is a very comfortable vehicle to yeah. drive. It's 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 incredibly spacious on the inside. Um, so the actual driving experience, the actual like being, because Paula, our producer, was with me when we went to to California to test the vehicle. She shot all the video. She drove it some. I drove it some. I got to be the passenger. It was just a very comfortable mm -hmm. vehicle to be in. Yeah. A lot of space. Very open and roomy. Um, and it has tons of power. 35 inch diameter tires with long travel, four corner independent airbag suspension. Yeah. So it ends up being like a really nice car to drive for I long distances. I think that there's a lot of impressive engineering that has gone into that car. Yeah. But there's um, a couple things that are a problem. The, the ground clearance is much less than the Rivian. 
Mm. Um, it, it has this deceptively low sided low quarter panel that you because of the way they did the the rock sliders it kind of obscures the fact that the chassis is much lower than the sliders mm. um, and that's because that's where all the batteries are so in the highest sp suspension modes the breakover is fine but in a lot of other cases it's low mm. in the center um, and that also makes it incredibly flat steering it's very low center of gravity but that's one of the things that I notice is it's fairly low compared to like the Rivian, for example. Um, and then I think it's also just that overall size. It's a very, mm. very big vehicle. Um, thank goodness it has four wheel steering. Mm. So the four wheel steering four -wheel steering is a game changer. It is. And I think that we're going to start seeing that on more off-road vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't always just have to crawl over something. You can also drive around it. Yeah. And that works great for that. Uh, the crab mode's fun. Yeah, there's like, a lot of yeah very interesting engineering with that. Watts to Freedom is fun. There's yeah. just there's lots of things. It's a fun vehicle. It's definitely supercar, super trucky yeah. on the EV yeah. side. Um, and I think it's what what it allowed for GM to do is to fund the development of all of these systems yeah. that there were that there were we're gonna see in vehicles that are a little more practical. The well, idea of a, of a Yukon AT4X yeah. that is, has all of that technology. Sounds amazing. Um, yeah, sounds that, amazing. that sounds great. Yeah, my, sounds my qualms are purely of a styling and reputational um, uh, uh, Yeah, it's, it's pretty tough to unwind the H2 legacy. It's pretty tough to unwind that. Well, so. yeah, but they have also this amazing legacy with the H1 and the yeah. H3 was a, a you know. much better car just came too late the hummer suv is very interesting very expensive very obscure unique styling yeah yeah so let's move on from the hummer suv to the defender 130 um i i have such incredible respect for the land rover brand and it all started for me from land rover none of this for me would have happened if it wasn't for that cover of a four-wheel drive magazine with the camel trophy on it yeah. and i've owned a lot of classic land rovers i've driven land rovers around the world and i have such just love i wouldn't love, even say love for the brand yeah. love for the brand i mean there's really not i, I wouldn't say and it's the respect. nicest people yeah they're just in a, yeah it love for the brand um i just have just true affection for it um, in recent years, I have not found that any of the modern land, they're all great cars, that's to be clear, but none of them have elicited that same mm. passion for me or even the consideration of buying one until the Defender 130. So Interesting. Because it's kind of a car that nobody really asked for. Yeah, but it's also the one that they needed to sell. Yeah. Um, okay. the, the 110... Um, it is fairly space constrained on the inside and it has more of a departure angle than you need for a vehicle of that kind. Yeah. Like how you would use a really nice defender is mm -hmm. not, doesn't require a, like a 45 degree departure angle. Yeah. So, um, I like the, the fact that, um, I like the fact that the, the 130 has more space in the rear. I also like how it, balances out the appearance of the vehicle. Some people don't care for that as much as I do, but it actually reminds me, like if we look at the Defender 110 behind us, it actually has sheet metal behind the rear tire. Mm. Like there's actually some material there, which is not the case for the 110, the modern or the current model 110. Yeah. It's this very abbreviated, it looks more like a Defender 90 did, a classic Defender 90 mm. did. Whereas the 110 always had some space behind it. So now the 130 looks reminiscent to me of the amount of space behind after the rear axle yeah. in a classic 110. Um, it actually drives a little bit more balanced on the trail. Um, the, the rear of the 110 is prone to popping up kind of unexpectedly or even a little bit more aggressively. Um, like we experienced that even a little bit on Van Zell's Pass. Yeah, I remember like the that. rear would but, ooh, pop up. It was up. the. <clears throat> On that, it was the left rear. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The 130, because it has a little bit more weight over the back, mm -hmm. it very Flexes much... a little bit more... And it settles that movement down because there's a little bit more weight aft of the rear axle. Um, it has a lot more space. You can buy it as a five-passenger model next year. So you end up with this totally load, flat load floor. You can sleep inside yeah. the vehicle. Um, I would actually... And I've like... 
I've gone on to the builder and I'm like, what does it take to build out one of these? Things? I always, I always look at building a defender, you know, same with you. Like I, I have a huge admiration for the brand. The defender is a lovely vehicle. It really like, is. I, I think it is one of like, as far as interiors go, it's one of my favorite interiors totally. ever put into a vehicle. And it's, it's because they have the, the that defender yeah. dash where you, you get in, your pocket knife, your wallet, your phone, your whatever, you just like throw it in front of you yep. and then you go on with your day and it's 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 really great. But there's always a but with Land Rover and do do I personally trust one? Knowing that I live an hour and a half, two hours from the closest Land Rover, a yeah. hundred miles from the closest Land Rover dealer, that's... Yeah, and how much of that do you feel is reputation of, let's call it a... 2001 discovery two or how much of that you feel <clears throat> is is actually an issue with the current vehicle it's probably all of the above like yeah. i i know that there have been quality problems with the yeah. new the new defender they are made in a in a new yeah manufacturing um, there was also a lot going on at that time i mean you know Maybe they, they were ramping up as covid was starting and you know not to use covid as an excuse necessarily but the automotive world got turned on its head it with did. supply chains. It so, did. you know, I always, I always look at them. Um, but you know, anybody that listens to the podcast know that, um, I don't really keep things for that long. Yeah. So I'm really interested in a year at like a certified pre-owned defender 110. There you go. And then perfect. Cause they'll be enjoy it for a instead year of them being on. 90 grand or a hundred grand and really hard to get. They're gonna be forty-five grand, or fifty-five even. Or 50, yeah, like they're not. Th- yep. And you still have the same potential for issue. I don't know. I think that they're really cool. I think that they're really capable. I think they have a lot of features that are in them that are really nice. But yeah, I like the one thirty. Yeah. And the my only disappointment, in fact, this is the only disappointment that I have in the car, is that you can't put an eighteen on it because uh, it comes only with the six cylinder or. You know, by the time that we this goes live, it'll also be available with a V8, um, which is a very and nice that gets parent. the bigger brakes, it which does. means you're there's no off road 19 inch tires, so that or, means you're at a 20. You're at a 20, um, and that it's a mistake. It, it like every manufacturer, if you're listening to this podcast, it is a mistake. Yeah, the the Hummer at 10,000 pounds. So I'm going to give a compliment to the Hummer. The Hummer is 10,000 pounds mm. as the truck, almost. It has an 18-inch wheel. Yeah. If you can stop a 10,000-pound electric truck, you can stop a Defender with an 18-inch wheel. You can put the brake package on there that allows you to fit the wheel diameter that is appropriate for the vehicle's intention. The 110 is designed to be an adventure vehicle. It's designed to be an off-road vehicle. Even if it's not used in extreme terrain, if you take them in the sand, you can't air down low enough. Yeah. If you get into snow, you cannot air down low enough. They, There's not enough flotation. With those decisions, they end up being, they, they never end up being in the consideration set for what the Defender was supposed to be. Did, but they did everything else. They, they give it a rear locker. Yeah. They give it crossed axle air suspension with good articulation. I just drove one in the Arabian Desert. Yeah. Um, big dunes, trails long distances dr- driving around the country. Yeah. Um, and I liked the car a lot. Mm. My big disappointment is the 20 inch wheel. It is not appropriate for the kind of, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with it on a Range Rover, but if you're going to throw that defender nameplate on it, like give us an 18 inch wheel, yeah. it's that simple. Yeah. So, which you can get on the 110, right? You can, that's yeah. right. You just have to get the four cylinder drivetrain. We're going to do rapid fire. So AT4 X, okay. we had the AT4 X, Sierra for a while, um, incredible. Half is that a ton newer truck. generation than one you have? Yeah, it okay. is exactly. So it is newer generation, brand new interior, very luxurious. Rear locker, front locker, um, gets rid of that terrible G80 mechanical locker out of the rear. Thirty-three inch diameter tires, Multimatic suspension, mm. rock sliders. Yeah, um, and now they have an AEV edition. 
in the AT4X, which gives you AEV bumpers, front and rear, and a bunch of other cool things, and a, and a larger diameter tire. So these are these are very cool trucks. Um, I would have never imagined five years ago that GM would have the most capable half ton pickup. Oh, I, I would never if if somebody was like in the year two thousand. I don't know when you got that one. Twenty one. Yeah. In the year two thousand twenty one, Scott Brady is going to buy a GM product. <laughs> yeah, I would exactly. be like. I would have never thought it. Yeah. I would have yeah, never yeah. thought it. But it was, I mean, my truck has been fantastic. I love the Super diesel. Super quiet inside. And now you can get the AT4X, AEV, Sierra with all of the off-road goodies, and you can now get the three-liter diesel again. So it's just like, mm. like you can hear the cherubs singing. It's a really amazing truck. Um, the only downside, again, is payload. You can load those things up to the point where you get pretty low on the payload number. Yeah. So you get really limited around truck campers and the the 1500 is not warranted for a truck camper so you're kind of making a personal decision like if you do some damage to the bed or whatever mm. you're out of warranty on that um but amazing trucks it's incredible to see what what they're doing with that the, <laughs> real quick the maverick tremor I'm, oh, i I'm, love the maverick i'm a huge fanboy of the maverick um they, you can buy a four-cylinder hybrid front-wheel drive model for about 24000 bucks if you could yeah. find one. Um, they get 40 miles to the gallon. You have a, it's, you have a mini, mini truck. Yeah. We don't have mini trucks anymore. It's a perfectly sized truck to put yeah. your mulch and your... Or your mountain bike. Mountain or your, bike or whatever. Or yeah. even a motorcycle in the back. Um, so the, the, tre the Maverick is just super cool, and the Tremor gives it the drivetrain of the Bronco Sport. So you've got this... Oh, cool. Like, those kind of boogie. a yeah. kind of a locker in the rear. Um, they call it a locker. You actually have a locker button, but it, it isn't. It doesn't give you a mechanical 100%. locker. Yes, yeah. that's right. Um, and then it has a center differential lock. It's got a larger diameter tire and about a one inch lift. Super fun to drive. I love driving them. I just I'm a huge fanboy of the Maverick. Yeah, I love the fact that we can buy a mini truck again. Mm -hmm. um, Go fast did a cool one where they they bought the truck and put the camper on there for less than 30 grand for a brand new vehicle super cool. with a go fast camper. That, that's just, to me, that's super fun. Sounds like a 30 inch yep. tire, 30 inch tire, little all terrain, little Falcon. Yeah. Wild peak all terrain. It's such, it's such an interesting, that, that whole setup with the go fast is such an interesting thing because it's, you're, you're doing that for Subaru money. Yeah. And th I, I will tell you the quality of the interior of the Maverick at, you know, low 20s is the same interior quality as a raptor yeah. in the 80s to 90s so it presents this uh, uh, very good value for money but i, I to think i totally agree. i think it's the best product in ford's range and i knew that i, I it, it took cojones they cannot to, make enough of them yeah it took cojones to put that in there because you're like oh people want bigger bigger more power whatever or we actually want this. But that's what they did. They, yeah. they released a mini Bravo. truck. Bravo they, Ford. Yeah, totally. It's such Rarely a, do I say Bravo Ford. Well, but. it's an awesome, awesome yeah. vehicle. Uh, and then the last thing is a little quick update on the Grenadier. I've had a chance to now spend another week in the Grenadier in an, a North American spec unit. Um, rock crawling, much higher speeds in the sand, um, hill climbs. I kind of had the vehicle to do whatever I wanted mm -hmm. with. And it just keeps getting more and more impressive to me. Yeah. It, it's important to note that the, that the drivetrain is well balanced to the intention of the vehicle, but it's not overly powerful. Like we've been having so many powerful vehicles in the marketplace now. Yeah. Um, but in my mind, it feels very well balanced to the vehicle. I like the seating position. Um, the lockers engage and disengage well. The traction control system works well. The tire size and the suspension dynamics are all really well balanced to the vehicle. So now that I've had some time to kind of have it in the wild, yeah. I like it even more than the first time I drove it. So the Grenadier keeps getting better and better, and it's getting closer and closer to being available. So by the yeah. time this goes live, there's a chance that we're going to have some or see some important announcements. I'm from excited. Ineos. I think I think it's it's a return to purpose for, um, like you said, like. There's a lot of 700 horsepower pickup trucks out there. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, I guess there's only two, but you know the point. Yeah, yeah. but this this is built for overlanding. Yeah. And, and in fact, there's a little plaque on the front of the truck, and it's one of my favorite things about it because it shows the intention. It's the mission statement of the business, built on purpose. Yeah. 
It is built on purpose to go around the world. It's yeah. built on person purpose to go down to Panama. It's yeah. built to do those things. I, I'm so excited for and it. And we get to buy one before we know it. It's just awesome. Cool. So, well, thanks, Matt. That's our mashup. Wow. Thanks. We'll have to do another episode just on the vehicles that you've bought and sold. So, Yeah. <laughs> Need a few hours. Thanks, Matt. See ya. All right. We'll talk to you all next time. <laughs>